Hello, good morning once again. I hope you've been enjoying this conference, the second day of Portech Conference. And we have now uh, with us Elad Schechter. Welcome, Elad. Thank you. Happy to be here. And Elad and me were talking, we were talking. Um, he's going to tell us how to create pure CSS games. He's physically from Israel. Thank you so much for joining us, Elad. Um, you were telling me that you did this project, this side project during the pandemic, and we are really eager to hear you because CSS uh, is very used here, at least in our ecosystem. So let's hear what the knowledge that you are that you will share with us. Thank you very much to be with us, Elad. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> and let's start. The coronavirus pandemic has disrupted our life in so many ways. Even for me, that I just started to talk in physical conference around the world in the end of the year of 2019, all the conferences that came after the physical one has been canceled. And in this situation in life, you maybe can be sad. But from my perspective for life, we don't have time to be sad. Life is so short. And because of that, we always need to think about how to create a good situations from a bad ones. And this is exactly what I've done when the coronavirus pandemic started. In the beginning, we have a lot more time to spend at home. And in the first few days, I was rearrange my apartment, move everything, change everything, open my sofa to a bed that sometimes I can sleep in my living room. And that environment that didn't work for five years, I put some water and some fishes and everything to create a good mood to stay at home. And then came the first weekend in the lockdown that we cannot go out anywhere. And I thought to myself, what I will do with all this free time? And I remember that several years ago, I created a pure CSS game, which is called Kill the Birds, that so many web developers all around the world loved it so much. But I thought to myself that in the last several years, I learned so many new tricks in CSS that now I can create a lot better one but I needed an idea of what it will be about. And it was one of the most easiest ideas that I had in my life. Because if we are now living in the coronavirus pandemic time, why not to create a coronavirus game? And this is exactly what I've done. I created this pure CSS game, which is called the Coronavirus Invaders. And everything that you are seeing right now is done only while using CSS and HTML. Yes, for the... Uh, CSS part, I'm using CSS for preprocessor. And even for the HTML part, I'm using an HTML preprocessor. But all the logic of this game, like when I'm clicking on the OMI button and it's opening a pop-up, the logic of the opening and the closing of the pop-up is done only while using CSS and HTML. And when I will click the Save the Wall button, the Play button of the game, it will hide the game navigation and it will open the game frame itself. Even that logic is done only while using CSS and HTML. And when you are clicking on those coronavirus creatures, they will be disappear. The score of the game will go up. And even that is done only while using CSS and HTML. And what about the countdown? No, really, the countdown is built only while using CSS. But before you're writing any single line of code, you need to think about something that inspires you. And I don't know why I remember an old code pen that I was saw in the middle of the year of 2018 with those uh, cute creatures that was painted on canvas HTML. And they remind me a little bit the coronavirus creatures. And I needed to think about a name for the game and how to design the main navigation. And I don't know why I remember the chicken invaders old game and I took the invaders word and uh, some other design ideas on how to design the main navigation. And when you are thinking about inspiration is not to create everything from nothing. Inspiration is always to take other older ideas and to create from them something else, something new. And the first thing that I wanted to create is to create the coronavirus creatures. And it's nice to see that this was my inspiration, but in the end, the coronavirus creature was looking different. And I love it because this is my coronavirus creature. 
And then I wanted to start to create the HTML of those coronavirus creature. And for me, the HTML is very important. It's not just to take HTML element and to throw them to an HTML document. No, this is an object of coronavirus creature of HTML, and it needs to be very precise. Then I created this label HTML element with a class of coronavirus, and inside I put an input type radio. And you may ask why I'm using here label HTML element and why there is an input type radio inside. This is part of the logic that we will talk about it a little bit later. But all the visual part of the coronavirus creature are starting here. We have the body and inside the body we have those 12 hairs and it's both eyes. But from the beginning, I saw that I have a lot of repetition in my code, like to create those 12 span HTML element. And in the real game, I have 100 coronavirus creatures. And I didn't want to copy paste them one by one. And I needed to think about a way to solve this problem. And in my first time in my life, I'm using here an HTML preprocessor of Pug that give us the possibility to use variables and to create a lot of repetition in the HTML part. And yes, for the CSS part, I'm using the CSS preprocessor of SAS that I'm using in the last 10 years for every one of my projects. And in this way, instead of writing this duplication, for example, of all those error HTML elements, I'm using here pug with variables, while loop, and creating the HTML dynamically. But as you can see, pug is written very different from regular HTML. Yes, when it's compiled, it's compiling to totally regular HTML. But when you are working with pug, you cannot write half pug and half HTML. If you are working with pug, you need to write everything in Pug. And this means that I needed to update all the HTML code to the new Pug way that is being written. And uh, yes, you need to get used to it, but all this project I was created in two days in the weekend and I was learning Pug meanwhile I was creating this project. Because of that, everyone can learn Pug. It's really not so hard. And now I wanted to start to paint the visual part of the coronavirus creature. I started with the body of the coronavirus creature. I gave it position relative. Why position relative? Because all the other parts need to be according to its body. And I gave the body width and height of 100 pixel, background color black and border radius of 50% to get the circle shape. To create all of the eyes and to select the two classes of I1 and I2 together combined, I'm using here the attribute selector with the star character. And in the same way, just a little bit different, width and height, a little bit different, background color white and border radius of 50%. Because the width and the height are a little bit different, the border radius of 50% creating us an egg shape that is nice to get. To locate them, I gave both of them position absolute top 25% for the first eye, left 25%, the right eye, right 25%, a little bit rotated to the inside. To create the inner part of the eyes without adding another HTML element, I'm using here the before pseudo element of every one of those eyes. And in the same way, width, height, background color, black, and border radius of 50%. And if you are looking, what I created until now is just circles, circles, and circles. To create the hairs of the coronavirus creature and to select all the classes, if you remember, between air one until air 12. Again, I'm using here the attribute selector with the star character. And every one of those hair is created from two boxes that I'm creating with the before and the after pseudo element. The after pseudo element is the root of the hair that I'm putting in the bottom. And the crown of the hair is the before pseudo element that I'm putting up above. And to get the circle shape, I'm just giving it border radius of 50%. To locate all those hairs, First, I gave all of them position absolute and locate all those 12 hairs exactly in the middle, in the center of the coronavirus creature, exactly here in the middle. And now one by one, I want to put them around the coronavirus creature. How I'm doing it? First hair will get a transform property with a rotate Z value of zero degrees, and then the translate Y value with the value of minus 65 pixels that will take the hair from the middle in the center to the top. But the second hair, need to be top, but little bit to the right, about 30 degrees. How I'm doing it? Hair two will get a transform property with a rotated Z value of 30 degrees, and only then the translate Y value with a value of minus 65 pixel. In this way, the second hair will go top, but little bit to the right. 
And if you didn't know until now, the order in the value of the transform property are very important because they are affecting each other. And in this way, I just located all those 12 hairs around the coronavirus creature. As you can see here, different rotate Z value and the same translate Y value. But as you can see here, we have a lot of repetition in our code. And we as web developers don't love to create repetition. How can we do it in another way? Because I'm working with SAS, in SAS, we can do repetition, for example, with the SAS for loop. And this is exactly what I'm doing in my real project. First, I'm creating a SAS variable with the name of star position, and I'm giving it a value of zero degrees. Then I'm creating a SAS for loop that has another SAS variable with the name of i. This variable is going automatically between 1 to 12 in every one of the iteration. This creating me dynamically the CSS selector between L1 until L12. In every one of the iteration, the SAS variable of start position is getting bigger by 30 degrees, and I'm just putting this SAS variable inside the rotate Z value inside the transform property. And in this way, I just now created you the CSS. Nice. But I wanted this creature to feel a lot more alive, and I wanted to do animation for all those hairs. But I had a problem. Every one of the a hair is located with different transform value. And if I want to do animation for all those 12 hairs, I needed to do a CSS animation separately for every one of those hairs. Because I didn't want to create it one by one, I created all those 12 animation dynamically in the same SAS for loop. In this way, I'm writing one animation, but creating dynamically 12 different animation. Nice, but I wanted this creature to feel a lot more alive and I wanted to add animation for the eyes and I added two animation for the eyes. One for the inner part of the eyes that they will move a little bit. And I wanted to create the effect that the eyes are getting closed. How can I do it? I'm using it here the second pseudo element of every one of the eyes, the after pseudo element and it's inside the all of the eyes. And how it really works, it has a width of 100% height of zero pixel and background color black. Because, it's, because it has a height of zero pixel, you don't see it. But in the animation of it, every five seconds, only in the last half second, it's getting a height of 100%. And in this way, the eyes are getting closed. But enough talking about the logic of the creature or the visual part of the creature, now let's talk about all the logic of the game. And the first thing that you need to understand is how to separate it, all the frames that we have in our own game. And to do that, let's take a look again on the game itself. And let's open the game itself and let's understand what frame we are exactly having in our own game. Let's open it. Uh -uh. Thank you. And the first frame, as you can see here, is the game menu frame. And this is the first frame that we need to represent in our HTML code. The second one is when I will click on the auto play button, it will open a pop-up. This is another type of frame. And yes, we can put frame above other frames. And this is the second frame that we need to represent in our HTML code. The third one is when I will click on the one my, it will open another pop-up. And this is the third pop-up, the second pop-up, the third frame. And this is the third frame that we need to represent in our HTML code. And the last one is when I will click the save the world button, it will hide the game menu frame and it will open the game frame itself where we are playing the game. And this is our last four frame that we need to represent in our HTML document. And how I'm representing all those frames in a very easy way, I'm just creating four separated section HTML element. And as you can see by the class name, and by the ID name, the first one is the game menu frame. The second one is the game frame itself. The third one is the pop-up of uh, UMI. And the last one is the pop-up of how to play. But when I'm loading this game, I want to see only the game menu frame. I don't want to see all the other frames. How can I hide all the other frames in a, a, a very easy way that everyone knows? I'm just giving all the other frames display none. And in this way, when I'm loading the game, I'm only seeing the game menu frame. But now we come the starting the uh, tricky part. I need to create some flags in the 
in my project that they will tell me if something is open or something is closed. How can I create flags without using any JavaScript? And here come the fun part. What I'm using here in the real game, I'm using here a, a form element of input type checkbox. Checkbox says there are like flags, unchecked, this is false, checked, this is true. And this is exactly what I'm heading in the beginning of the HTML document. I'm adding free input of checkboxes. And as you can see, every one of them have a specific ID name. And for this first checkbox, what I need to do, that if it's unchecked, I want to see the game menu frame and to hide the game frame. But if this first checkbox is checked, I want to see the game frame and to hide the game menu frame. The two other checkbox are even more simple to understand. For example, the checkbox that has the ID name of how to play pop-up, if it's unchecked, I don't want to see the pop-up. And if it's checked, please show me the pop-up. The first checkbox in the same way as the second one the, that has the ID name for my pop-up. If it's unchecked, I don't want to see the OMI pop-up. And if it's checked, please show me the OMI pop-up. But those are just checkboxes that I'm putting in the beginning of the HTML document with opacity of zero, position absolute top minus something, and you cannot see them and you cannot click on them specific. But now we need a way to trigger those checkboxes without clicking on them specific. How can I do it? For that, I'm using a very old feature that exists from the beginning of the HTML. The game navigation button that you saw in the game are not button HTML element. Instead, I'm using here label HTML element. And label HTML element can trigger any input that you want with the four attribute that can be connected to a specific input. For example, this save the world label button element, this one is connected with a for attribute to the checkbox that has the ID name of toggle game. You see toggle game here and toggle game here. This means that if I'm clicking on this label button element, it will trigger this checkbox and it will change the status from unchecked to checked. If you will click it again, it will change again from checked to unchecked. And as many times that you will clicking on it, okay? The same way for the two other label button. For example, if I would click the OMI label button, this one, it will trigger the checkbook that has the ID name of OMI pop-up, OMI pop-up, and this will change the status from unchecked to check. It will click it again. It will, can, it, will, it will change again from check to unchecked and as many times that you will clicking on it. But this is just changing those statuses of those checkbook cells. It still doesn't do anything, any visual thing in our own game. And now, we need to use this status of these choke boxes to show or hide other frames of the game. And to do that, I'm using here two special CSS feature. The first feature is the check pseudo class. I can see if there is a specific checkbox that is in the status of checked. And if there is, I can use now the sibling selector that can select me any sibling element that can come after, for example, and I can give it display block, display none. And in this way, I can show or hide other frames in the game. And this is exactly what I'm doing in my real game. For example, when I'm clicking on the how to play label button, it will trigger the checkbox that has the ID name of how to play pop-up, and it will change its status from unchecked to checked. And if this checkbox that has this ID name is in status of checked, this selector will start to work for us. If this checkbox is in status of checked, please go to the sibling element that has the ID name of how to play. This is the real pop-up and just give it a display block. And in this way, now this pop-up is open, but now you need to ask yourself another question. How I'm closing the pop-up? And it's really the same idea if you're thinking about it. When this checkbox is in status of check, this pop-up is being open. When this pop-up is open, this means that this checkbox is in status of check. And the only thing that I need to do now is to change the status from check to unchecked. And to do that, the X button and the close button, again, are not button HTML element. Again, there are label HTML element that in this case of this specific pop-up, they are both connected with the for attribute to the same ID of this specific checkbox. And this means that if I'm clicking on the X button or the close button, 
it will change the status of this checkbox from checked to unchecked. This selector will stop to work and then we will get the display none that we declared in the beginning. And now the pop-up will be closed. Nice. But now you need to ask yourself another question. How the save the world button is working? Because when I'm clicking on the save the world button, the play button of the game, I need to do two operation instead of one. First, I need to hide the game menu frame, and then I need to show up the game frame itself, where we are playing the game. How can I do two operations instead of one with one specific checkbox, with one status of one specific checkbox? And it's really the same idea if you're thinking about it. The checkbox that has the ID name of Toggle Game. If you're in status of checked, first go to the sibling element that has the class name of game menu frame, and hide it with display none. After that, go to the sibling element that has the class name of game frame and give it display block. And in this way, I can do as many operations that I want with one specific uh, status of one specific checkbox. This way of written is written, of course, with a CSS preprocessor of SAS. Uh, you can write it in uh, two separated CSS selectors, but it's a lot more readable to write it and uh, read it with SAS. Nice, but now let's continue for one of the most amazing tricks that we have in our own game. The first trick is when I'm clicking on those coronavirus creature, they need to be disappear. The second trick is that I need to count all those dead viruses. Let's talk about those two amazing tricks in my own game. If you remember in the beginning, I told you that every coronavirus creature is a label HTML element with a class of coronavirus. And I also told you that uh, we have input type radio inside, but I also told you that all the visual part of the coronavirus creature are here in this div class body. We have the body and inside we have the eyes and the hairs. And what I'm doing in the real game, I'm doing animation on the label HTML element and I'm telling it to move around the screen because all the visual parts are inside, all the visual parts are going with it. But it's also to, uh, uh, saying that if I'm clicking on the visual part of the virus, it's like I'm clicking on the label HTML element because it's wrapped with the label HTML element. And if I'm putting input type radio inside, this is a very special thing. It will automatically get triggered. You don't even need the four attribute and the ID name in this case. Because it's inside the label, it will automatically get triggered. This means that I'm moving this label part with all the visual part inside. I'm clicking the visual part of the coronavirus creature, it's like I'm clicking on the label HTML element. And because the input type radio is inside, it will automatically get trigger and it will change the status from unchecked to status of checked. And this status is telling us that the virus is being dead. And now we need to hide the visual part of the coronavirus creature. To do that, I'm just selecting the input type radio. If you're in status of checked, Go to the sibling element with class of body. This is all the visual part of the coronavirus creature. This is here, yes. And just give it opacity of zero. And in this way, you are clicking those coronavirus creature and they are being disappeared from the screen. Nice. But now we need to create the CSS core of the game. And to do that, I'm using here another special CSS feature, the CSS counter feature. And what is very special with this feature that you can count things in the HTML document. In order to it to work properly, because I need to count all those uh, radio buttons that are being checked, to declare the CSS uh, counter, you need to declare it before all the input app radio in the game. The easiest place to put it, it's just on the body HTML element. How are you creating a CSS counter? You are selecting the body HTML element, for example, we are using the property of counter reset, this creating a CSS counter, and you can give now this counter any name that you want. I gave it the name Corona. And now I need to count all those dead viruses. I'm selecting every input type radio that is in status of checked, counter increment, incrementing the Corona value that we created here. And now I need to summarize the total score to the screen. In order to it to work properly, it's need to be written in the HTML document after all the input type project that we have in our own game. The easiest place is to put it on the bottom of the HTML document. I created this div with class of sum. 
the text score, as you can see, is coming from here. And after, I want to print the total score. To do that, I'm just selecting the class of sum using the after procedure element, using the content property that is using the native CSS counter function that printing me the corona value that I incremented here and created here. And this is always listening and printing the total score to the screen. Because it's a very complicated example, I want to show you this in a real live code demo. And let's see it in a real code example. As you can see here, I kind of created five coronavirus creature. You can see the input type radio is here. In the real game, it has opacity of zero and the visual part of the coronavirus are here. This is the body, this is the big black circle. In the real game, the eyes and the hairs are here inside, okay? Very important. And a place to summarize the total score in the bottom, this class sum, the text score is coming from the HTML, as you can see here, but the numbers are coming from the CSS. To create a CSS counter, I'm selecting the body HTML element with the property of counter reset. I gave it the name Corona. And for every input type radio that is in the status of checked, counter increment, incrementing the Corona value that we declared on the body HTML element. And beside of it, if the input type radio is in status of check, go to the sibling element with class of body and give it opacity of zero. If this input type radio will be checked, this visual part of the coronavirus creature will be disappear. Nice. To summarize the score, I'm selecting the class of sum and using here the after pseudo element, using the content property that using the CSS native counter function. And I'm just printing here the corona value that I incremented here and created here. Let's see that it really works. I'm clicking on those coronavirus features that are being disappeared. You can even see the radio buttons are being checked. The score is going up. And with this way, you are creating a pure CSS score for a pure CSS game. Nice. And let's continue to another amazing tricks. Let's jump. How can I create a pure CSS countdown? Let's see this in the real code example, okay? As you can see here in the HTML, we don't have any numbers. These numbers are not coming from the HTML. Again, they are coming from a CSS on animation that I'm doing on the content property. But as you can see here, the animation is going only between nine to zero, but here it's going between 99 to zero. What is really happening here? This both uh, this one number, it's not really one number, it's two separated string that has string values of numbers. And it's only looking like one real integer uh, that is going between 100 uh, to zero. But we actually have here two separated string that are only very synchronized that you understand what is really happening here. Let's bring a sprint in this pen HTML element with the class of count, the text AA. And you will see that these both numbers are being separated. They don't have any real connection between of them. Okay? And how it really works. Let's explore the code itself of the CSS. As you can see, uh, I'm doing animation on the before pseudo element. This is the first value of the number. Okay? This one. And I'm calling the animation of countdown. This animation. I'm telling it to work for 100 seconds and one iteration. And because the animation have total of 10 frames, this means that every 10 seconds will go one number down, 20 another, 30 another, and so on and so on. When it will finish the first iteration, I want it to be stuck on the last frame of the animation of zero. To do that, I'm using here the special keyword forwards that telling the animation, when you are finished, please be stuck on the last frame of the animation. The second value of the number I'm creating with the after pseudo element. I'm now using the same animation, but in a different way. I'm telling the animation to work for a total of 10 seconds and 10 iteration. 10 seconds, 10 frames. This means that every one second will go one number down, two another, three another. When it will finish the first iteration, it will do it again for another nine iterations because I told it to work for a total of 10 iteration. And after all those iterations, I want that the second value will be stuck after all those iterations, when it will be finished, I want it to be stuck on the zero value. To do that, again, I'm using here the forwards value, the telling the animation. When you are finished all your iteration, please be stuck on the last frame of the animation. And let's see that it really works. Eight, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and finish. Nice. Let's continue to our next thing. Random values, random values. First, I want to show you why I want to create random stuff in my own project. And let's see the game itself again. And as you can see here, the location of the coronavirus, which are randomized. Actually, every coronavirus, which have six different locations on the Y axis. Even the scale of them is being randomized and even the rotation of them is being randomized. But wait a minute, how can I create random stuff in CSS? You can't, but you can do it with SAS. Because it's a very important example, I want first to show you this in the real code. You need to understand that if every one of the viruses have different location in the game, this means that I, need, uh, that I needed to create 100 different animation for every one of those viruses. And you can guess, I didn't want to write them one by one. Then how I created them, let's take a look on the game itself. Let's see this. Here, as you can see, uh, I'm creating a SAS for loop that is running 100 iteration according to the amount of the coronavirus creature. And this means that this is creating me this animation 100 times, every time with a, diff a new different name. And every virus has six different locations in the game. The translate X is always the same, but the translate Y, I'm using here the SAS random function that randomizes me a value, for example, between 1 to 80, and I'm just doubling it in one VH. Even for the scale of the virus, I'm using the random function. Even for the rotation of the virus, I'm using here the random function. That you will understand exactly how it really works, let me show you another example of the SAS random function that you will not be afraid from it. Let's see the compile HTML that you will see that this is a really regular HTML element. And we have here six uh, empty HTML element. The numbers that you are seeing inside are not coming from the HTML. Instead, they are coming from the CSS. And what I'm doing in the SAS code, as you can see here, I have a for loop that is running six iteration. This creating me dynamically the CSS selector between class one to class six. In every one of the iteration in the before pseudo element, I'm using the regular content uh, uh, at, uh, element, uh, pseudo attribute, sorry. And inside I'm using here the uh, SAS random function that randomizes me a value between one to 80 and I'm just doubling it in one VH. As you can see here, all those numbers are really randomized. For you to believe me that they are really randomized, let's do a small change in the SAS code and we will see that those numbers are really changed. I'm pressing enter, I'm discompiling it again to CSS and the numbers are being changed. If I would do it again, you will see the numbers are being changed again and again and again, okay? Every time that I'm compiling the SAS code, it's creating new values in the before pseudo element, okay? And uh, how it really looks in the CSS, because SAS is not reading in the browser, it's being compiled to CSS. And if you will look in the compiled CSS, you will see that this is just a regular CSS. In order to those value to change, we need to compile the SAS code again and again and again. If we are not compiling it again and again and again, it will be stuck on the same values. Okay, nice. Let's continue to our next trick. After 99 seconds of the game, I'm putting the game over curtain. And I wanted that the player can play this game again and again and again. But I understand that in order to it to happen, I need to reset all the checkboxes that I have in my project to unchecked. This will bring me automatically to the game menu navigation. And I need to reset all the radio button that was checked to uncheck. This will reset me the total score of the game. And to do that, this back to main menu button is not a regular button and it's a not a label HTML element as well. In this case, this specific button is a special button type of reset. And what is very special with this button that if I'm wrapping all the project with the form HTML element, when I will click on this special button, it will automatically reset me all the input that I have in my own project. All the checkboxes will be unchecked. All the radio button will be unchecked. This will bring me automatically to the game menu navigation. And now we can open the game itself and to play again and again and again. 
And the last question that you need to ask me is how can I know exactly when to put this game over curtain? And this is one of the easiest tricks that I have in my own game. Everyone know that animation can get animation duration. This thing is telling the animation how much time it's need to be take. But what we are forgetting that animation can get the animation delay property that has another duration that telling the animation after how much time you want it to be start. And what I have in the real game, I have animation delay of 99 seconds. And after 99 seconds, the game over curtain is being appear. In this example, because I don't want to wait 99 seconds, I only put here five seconds. And let's see that it really works. Let's refresh the screen and we will count together between one to five and we will see that we are seeing the game over curtain. Okay, let's refresh the screen. And one, two, three, four, and five. Game over. Nice. Okay, we saw here a lot of CSS tricks that we damn you are can create pure CSS game. And maybe you are asking me, this is the main key takeaway, but it isn't. What I want you to take from this talk is to create any project in code that you want. It can be pure CSS game, but it can be any other thing with JavaScript in every programming language which, that you can think of. And why it's important to create projects only for fun, not for your company, not for your friends, not just to making money, only by playing for code and only for fun. Because we as adults, we are forgetting that the best way to learn your stuff is by playing. When we are kids, we're doing it naturally. In the animal kingdom, it's the same. Small kittens, they are like hunting each other. They are playing and they're having fun. And when they are adults, they know how to hunt. But we, as adults, we start to learn things in the boring way, in the hard way. Instead of playing with code, have fun. In this way, we are a lot less frustrated when something is not succeeded, but we will succeed in the end. We are getting to be a lot better web developers. And in the end, if you are a lot better web developer, you will get a better salary. But even this is not important because life are so short. Create projects for fun because you can create stuff for fun. And my friends, I'm Elad Schechter. I'm a CSS HTML architect. I'm doing mainly CSS architecture stuff, uh, articles, and a lot of other stuff, big projects. You can see all the things that I'm doing and follow me via Twitter. You can see all my other articles in Medium, CodePen, some in Smashing Magazine, some in uh, uh, CSS Tricks. You can see all my other stuff and my other project in my own website. You can QR the slide here. And thank you very much for listening. Well, in the name of everyone, thank us. I love, it was such a great presentation. Uh, even even myself, I'm not into technical aspects, but it was really interesting to hear and to learn more about that. Um, I love, we have here Patricia Castro that wants to do a question. Is it okay? Yes, yes, I want questions. <laughs> First of all, she says that you have a lovely fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So the question is, Elav, will you recommend using a library to animate buttons and sections from a website or using only SAS? Uh, it really depends. Um, first of all, to do animation, we are doing it uh, uh, from the CSS. We can do it with SAS that will help us to write some things uh, in a more easier way. Uh, I think... Um, to do animation, we have kind of a lot of levels that we can do it. CSS, I think, is the is the most uh, in most of the cases the a lot more uh, good, easier for the browser to do it with CSS. If we are doing it in JavaScript, it's little a little bit uh, more hard for the browser. But we can maybe do other ways animation that maybe will be even better to do on SVG animation inside. It will be, be maybe will be even more better than CSS. And if you are doing animation in Canvas HTML, it will be more better. It has a lot of perspective. And even in CSS animation itself, you, you need to do how to do it right, not to do animation on the position location and, and instead to using it on the transform property. It's have a lot of small niche 
that you really need to understand the, and it's really different in every case and case, but if the library is working good, why not? It's, uh, there is not really bad and uh, good things totally. In every place we have uh, good and bad uh, values when we are doing, because if we are doing everything by hand, if we are taking us a lot of time, maybe it's bad because we are losing a lot of time. If we are doing it with JavaScript, maybe it's a lot easier and maybe it's a little bit more harder to the browser, but we earn a lot of other times to do other stuff. There is not really one good answer for this, but this is my way of thinking to see it. Nice. Thank you a lot. Uh, Francisco uh, Jimenez is uh, asking here also, um, a question to you. Um, it says, uh, is nesting too many HTML elements a bad practice in SAS? He asks. Uh, totally, totally. And uh, what you can do a lot of time, uh, you can use the end uh, signed and you can create, I'm using in a real project, let's say I have a component of breadcrumbs and we have a list in the breadcrumbs, we have breadcrumbs list, and we have uh, inside the item of the list. And what I'm doing in the SAS mainly, I'm using the class of breadcrumbs, and then I'm not using inside the point sign of to creating another class. I'm using the end sign with minus list, for example, and this creates me only one class. It creates me a class that is called breadcrumbs list. And in the item, I'm just drawing in the breadcrumbs another class and item, and it's creating me one class that is a called breadcrumbs item. In this way, I, it's not inside the class of breadcrumbs. It's only called breadcrumbs item. In this way, you are creating one class, but the logic connection, you can see it in the world, in the name of the class name. You have one class name that is called breadcrumbs, and you have one other class name that is called breadcrumbs list, and you have another cl class name that is called breadcrumbs item. In this way, every one of them is separated, but it still has the logic that they are combined and you can understand them when you are reading the class name. I hope that I answer it uh, in a way that it, I understand it, the idea, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally, for sure, um, a lot. So we have no more questions till now. I advise everyone who wants to continue to do questions and that will see uh, the recorded ver version in two weeks um, to go directly and talk with Elad on Twitter um, or on Medium, feel free. He will be very glad to answer to all your questions. Elad, what's such a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice week. Thank you. It was a big pleasure for me and all of you have a really good weekend. Thank you a lot. We keep in touch. Bye-bye.